the Shudder Chance for the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today, the Chancellor has lifted the lid on 13 years of economic failure. We were told that this was to be an autumn statement for growth, but the economy is now forecast to be £40 billion smaller by 2027 than the Chancellor said back in March. Growth revised down next year, the year after, and the year after that too. The Chancellor claims that the economy has turned a corner, yet the truth is that under the Conservatives, growth has hit a dead end. What has been laid bare today is the full scale of the damage that this Government has done to our economy over 13 years. And nothing that has been announced today will remotely compensate. Mortgages rising, taxes eating into wages, inflation high with prices still going up in the shops, public services on their knees and too many families struggling to make ends meet. As the sun begins to set on this divided, out of touch, weak government, the only conclusion that the British people will reach is this. After 13 years of Conservatives, the economy is simply not working and despite all the promises today, working people are still worse off. Mr Speaker, the centrepiece of today's autumn statement is a cut in the headline rate of national insurance. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm an old, I'm old enough to remember when the Prime Minister wanted to put up national insurance. As recently as January last year, he said, and I quote, we must go ahead with the increase in the health and care levy. It is progressive in that the burden falls most on those who can most afford it. Utter nonsense. It was a tax on working people and we opposed it for that very reason. Yet again, the Prime Minister is left arguing against himself. In response to last year's autumn statement, I warned that the government was pickpocketing working people through stealth taxes. I have long argued that taxes on working people are too high. Indeed, I said in my conference speech that I want them to be lower. From their failure to uprate income tax or national insurance bans to forcing councils to raise council tax, the Conservatives have pushed the costs of their failure onto others. But the British people won't be taken for fools. They know that what has been announced today owes more to the cynicism of a party desperate to cling on to power than the real priorities of this high-tax, low-growth Conservative government. So I think that we can forgive taxpayers for not celebrating when they see the truth behind today's announcements. Going into this statement, the government had already put in place tax increases worth the equivalent of a 10p increase in national insurance. So today's 2p cut will not remotely compensate for the tax increases already put in place by this Conservative government. The fact is that taxes will be higher at the next election than they were at the last. This is the legacy of the Conservatives, and that, Mr Speaker, is their record. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor and Prime Minister have spent the last two weeks marching their MPs up a hill, only to march them down again on inheritance tax. And let's not forget, when they realised that they had money to spend... You're chirping all the way through. Either go and get yourself that cup of tea or be quiet. Rachel Rivers. When they realised that they had money to spend, this government's first instinct was a tax cut for millionaires. But in the end, even they realised that they couldn't get away with it in the middle of a cost of living crisis. So can the Chancellor tell the House today, is cutting inheritance tax a decision delayed or a decision abandoned? This autumn statement for growth is now the 11th Conservative economic growth plan, from the 5th Prime Minister, the 7th Chancellor and the 9th Business Secretary. And and what do those numbers numbers add up to? According to the most recent GDP data, a big fat zero. That's zero growth 
in the most recent data in the third quarter of this year. Now, the Chancellor mentioned some countries that we are outperforming in growth, but I couldn't help notice that he failed to mention any of the many advanced economies that have grown faster than the UK. Yep. Yeah. Over the last 13 years of this low-growth Conservative government, the UK languages in the bottom third of OECD countries when it comes to growth. There are 27 OECD economies that have grown faster than us in the 13 years since 2010, including the US, Australia, Canada, Sweden, Slovenia and 22 others. In fact, over the next two years, no fewer than 177 economies are forecast by the IMF to grow faster. Oh, than the UK. Oh, sorry. Don't bother me, Mr. Speaker. Oh, it bothers me. I'm not being funny. I expect the same courtesies to the Shadow Chairs, the Exchequer. Those who wish to not give that courtesy, please go and find something else to do. Because my constituents are interested if yours aren't. Rachel Wiggs. And next year, Mr. Speaker, we are forecast to be the slowest growing economy in the whole of the G7. When it comes to economic growth, under the Tories, we are more world following than world beating. And let's look at how their record on growth compares to Labour's record on growth. Under the Conservatives, GDP growth has averaged 1.5% per year. But with Labour, it grew an average of 2% a year in the 13 years that we were last in office. Had the economy continued to grow at the rate it did with Labour, it would now be £150 billion bigger. So what is this government's economic record? Lower growth and higher borrowing, with debt more than doubling, now at almost 100% of GDP. This is a product of their failures over 13 years, a Tory government that has failed on growth failed on debt, failed on levelling up and failed on the cost of living too. And now they expect the British people to believe that when they say they are going to turn it all around, when it is them that is the problem and not the solution. Mr Speaker, if we are going to grow the economy, we must get more people into work. Let me be clear. People who can work should work. That's why we've long argued... That's why we've long argued that the work capability assessment needs replacing, because right now it is discouraging people from seeking work. But there's a wider problem that, yet again, this government is failing to face up to. Britain is the only country in the G7 where the employment rate still has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. With the increase in the number of people out of the workforce due to long-term health issues costing the taxpayer a staggering £15.7 billion a year. NHS waiting lists have swelled to 7.8 million, an additional half a million since the Prime Minister said he was going to cut them, and 2.6 million people are out of work due to long-term sickness. A healthy nation is critical to a healthy economy. That's why Labour has pledged to cut hospital waiting lists investing an additional £1.1 billion a year to deliver 2 million more appointments, scans and operations. It will be funded by abolishing the non-DOM tax status and replacing it with a modern scheme for people who are genuinely living in the UK for short periods. But once again, we see that this policy has been vetoed by the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the best way to get people back to work is to get our NHS working, but the reality is you can never trust the Tories with our NHS. Now, the Chancellor has made a great fanfare about public sector efficiency and value for money. This is from a government that has blown £140 million on a discredited Rwanda scheme and yet are not able to send a single asylum seeker there. £7.2 billion money lost on fraud during the pandemic, all those cheques signed up by the former Chancellor, the current Prime Minister. £8.7 billion on PPE that's been written off. HS2 costing £57 billion with not a single piece of track going north of Birmingham. No one can trust the Tories with taxpayers' money. And it says it all that after 13 years of Tory government, 
there are still nearly 12,000 NHS computers running on outdated software that's vulnerable to cyber attacks. Ten years ago, when he was Health Secretary, the now Chancellor promised a paperless NHS by 2018. Yet today, in 2023, 26 NHS trusts are still using fax machines. Now, why on earth should people who experience deteriorating public services under this Conservative government trust them to fix it? When his six years as Health Secretary makes him one of the biggest architects of failure. If you put your hands into people's pockets and take money out of them, and they don't see visible improvements in the services that they receive, they get very angry indeed. Not my words, the Chancellor's words, two years ago. And I agree with him. The Tories have had 13 years to improve public services, and they have failed. Mr Speaker, this is too little and too late. I do want to welcome the Chancellor's announcement today of additional funding to tackle anti-Semitism and Islamophobia to keep our communities safe, as well as the additional money for the Holocaust Educational Trust. There is no place for hate in our society, and I know that across the House we will work together to eliminate it. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor calls this an autumn statement for growth. But it is Labour who has led the agenda on growth. And today we see the Conservatives have released their own poor cover version of what we have already announced. The Chancellor today is talking about unlocking capital by reforming pensions. But Labour would go further, encouraging investment into British start-up firms and scale-up firms, and introducing measures to ensure the consolidation of pension funds so that our pension system gets better returns for savers and for the UK economy. On planning, the Conservatives are following Labour's lead on providing money off bills for communities that host grid infrastructure and speeding up planning decisions. What's taken them so long? Labour will get Britain building again, with a a once-in-a-generation set of reforms to accelerate the building of our country's national infrastructure and to build housing too. We will fast-track battery factories, our life sciences and 5G technology to grow our economy and provide good jobs in every part of our country. And we welcome the fact that the Chancellor has announced that he will make full expensing permanent, another thing that we have been calling for. But that doesn't make up for the years of uncertainty that businesses have faced with taxes going up and down like a yo-yo with small and medium businesses who play such a pivotal role in growing our economy, left exposed to the Tories' economic volatility. Labour's partnership with business will get our economy firing on all cylinders. That's why this week we established a new British Infrastructure Council with key investors in the UK economy, focused on unlocking private investment by addressing the delivery challenges businesses face when investing in Britain. Through Labour's new National Wealth Fund, we will work alongside the private sector to back the growth of British industries so that we can make the crucial transition to a zero-carbon economy. And for every pound of public investment, we will leverage in three times as much private investment, whilst also getting a return to taxpayers. Labour's plan will boost our economy, get debt falling and make working people better off. Now, Mr Speaker, if you listen to the benches opposite, you would believe that the cost of living crisis was behind us. But inflation is still double the Bank of England's target rate. I know the importance of low and stable inflation from my time as an economist at the Bank of England. Now, it is of course welcome that the Chancellor has accepted this year's recommendations from the Low Pay Commission that we set up on the minimum wage. But the reality is, of the Conservatives' record, the average wages for working people have been held back. Under this government, real average weekly wages have increased by just 3% in 13 years, compared to a 27% increase under the last Labour government, worth an additional £120 more every week for someone going out to work every day. And today, Mr Speaker, is Equal Pay Day, 
So it is also important to recognise that the living standards of working women have also been held back by a gender pay gap that I am determined to close. Now, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister say that the cost of living crisis is dealt with. Now, everything might look a little bit better 10,000 feet up in your helicopter. (laughs) But down here on planet Earth, but down here on planet Earth, people are approaching Christmas and the year ahead with worry and trepidation. The cost of living crisis has hit us harder because Tory mismanagement has left us so exposed. 11 million UK households don't have enough savings to cover three weeks of living expenses if they needed it. Working families have been skating on thin ice for too long, and as their resilience has been eroded, so has our national economies. Let's not forget it was this government that oversaw the closure of our critical gas storage facilities, which left our country more exposed to the huge fluctuations in international energy markets. While the former Prime Minister, that's four Prime Ministers ago, (laughs) cut energy efficiency programmes leading to higher bills for homeowners. And just last year, we saw the true cost of the Conservatives when their kamikaze budget crashed the economy, leading to market turmoil, pensions put in peril and a spike in interest rates. 1.6 million families will see their mortgage deals end this year. Those remortgaging since July have seen their payments rocket by an average of £220 a month. And next year, one and a half million families will face a similar fate. The Conservatives' economic recklessness inflicted a Tory mortgage penalty on families across the country. In Wellingborough, Families with a mortgage will be expected to find an additional £190 every single month. In Richmond, North Yorkshire, homeowners face £200 more a month on their mortgage. And in the Chancellor's own constituency, but maybe not for long, families with a mortgage will see an average increase of £420 a month because of this Conservative Government's economic failure. And with increased costs for landlords, and the Chancellor knows something about that as well, (laughs) renters are paying a high price too. The truth is, Mr Speaker, working people just don't have this sort of money lying around. But this is what we've come to after 13 years of Conservative government. And this is the record upon which people will judge the Conservatives at the next election. This Tory economic recklessness is not a thing of the past. The British people are still paying the price. And we say never again. Last week, Labour put forward an amendment to the King's speech to put our fiscal lock into law. It would prevent a repeat of last year's economic horror show. And yet the Tories voted against it. It is clear that today, Labour is the party of economic and fiscal responsibility. And what have the Conservatives learnt? The Conservatives have learnt absolutely nothing. Mr Speaker, the country is crying out for change. A decaying government can change its personnel, but they have failed to change the direction of our country. In 13 years, we have had seven chancellors. You wouldn't run a business like this. and You can't run a country like it either. And the Prime Minister can't even promise that this Chancellor will be in place at the next election. (laughs) We've all heard the reports. When they first came together, it was the fairy tale marriage. But one year on, the relationship has hit the rocks. The pair have grown apart, with rumours running rife that the Prime Minister already has his eyes on someone else. But whoever this Prime Minister picks as the Chancellor, the truth is this. Britain is and will be worse off under the Conservatives. They have held back growth. They have crashed our economy, increased debt, trashed our public services, left businesses out in the cold and made life harder for working people. Our country cannot afford five more years of the Conservatives. Mr Speaker, the Ravens are leaving the Tower when even Saatchi and Saatchi are saying the Tories are not working. And the questions that people will be asking at the next election 
and after today's autumn statements are simple. Do me and my family feel better off after 13 years of Conservative government? Do our schools, our hospitals, our police, do they work better after 13 years of Conservative government? In fact, does anything in Britain work better today than when the Conservatives came into office 13 years ago? We all know that working people are worse off under the Conservatives. With growth down, mortgages up, prices up, taxes up, debt up, and Mr Speaker, their time is up. It is time for change, a changed Labour Party to lead Britain and to make working people better off. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Deputy Speaker, indeed. Uh, and I'm afraid the Shadow Chancellor has shown once again that Labour has nothing credible to say on the economy. She tells the papers this morning that she will accept these measures, as you would expect from a copy and paste Shadow Chancellor. Um, and can, I, can I say, in all, in all sincerity, that I particularly welcome her conversion to supporting full expensing, which she actually voted against in this House, that is copying and pasting in the national interest, and we welcome it on this side of the House. She, um, she compared growth rates under Labour and the Conservatives, but she carefully omitted one fact. Labour inherited a golden legacy from the Conservatives and then proceeded to trash the economy before handing it over. And, and when it comes to when it comes to growth, when it comes to growth, uh, she didn't like it when I reminded her that we have grown faster under the Conservatives than any other major European economy. And she says that she is now converted to Conservative supply side reforms on welfare. So I look forward to her voting with us on the lobbies on those. But her main policies are not supply side. It is a demand-side boost to growth by increasing borrowing by £28 billion a year, with absolutely no plans to repay it. Now, the Shadow Chief Secretary, who does not appear to be in his place, um, this morning he asked for more action on inflation. Well, the first thing Labour could do is drop their damaging inflationary plan to ramp borrowing up. Um, now, she talked, about, uh, she talked about the NHS. Uh, and despite the fact that we've had more doctors, more nurses, uh, we've had more patients treated in good or outstanding hospitals. Again, what she didn't mention is the only place in Britain that NHS funding has been cut is Wales. Not once, but twice, with the longest hospital waits in Britain. And, and, and perhaps, perhaps we should talk about what's happened after 13 years when we repaired Labour's damage. Unemployment down, poverty down, crime down, low pay down, schools funding up, NHS funding up, jobs up, growth up, because Conservatives know that lower tax is the path to higher growth, and today we make a start. Yeah.